Everybody got their Bibles? Amen. Got a guest preacher today, Brother James, Deacon James. Come on, give us a word from the Lord. Okay. You know, I've decided um, uh, anytime you have me preach, I'm just going to go like to another place outside of the house. Because me and you cannot be in the same house and uh, you do adult Sunday school and I do that. Because actually, what I'm talking about today, what I'm preaching about, is actually in Judges 6. I love it when I have I'm like holding my breath. We don't share notes. Don't. Yeah, we, we don't. don't. Notes. <laughs> Not at all. I'm holding my breath back there because I'm like, all right, like this is good. This is good because you've just cleaned up a lot of uh, the things that I had explained uh, to keep this sermon from having to go longer uh, you know, over an hour and stuff that we had in the past. You've helped me by cleaning up a lot of the backstory and the things that are going on. Uh, today, obviously, I'm not, uh, I mean, we're always preaching about the God of peace, but today is not about what I'm preaching about. It's not on uh, the God of peace. Although there's a reason why uh, his name was revealed to Gideon after he followed through on some things and the acts that Gideon did and all of that was all started by one act that this man did. And we're going to find out today. Before we start, let's go ahead and pray. Uh, dear Lord, thank you for your word that it's rich, Lord. It's enduring. Uh, it's full of life, Lord. You spoke your word and it continues to go on. Let it to be in the hearts of the saints today, Lord. Uh, let us to all hear with both ears today. Get something out of it, Lord. Touch your people today. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. So we're in Judges 6. As I was saying before, uh, there was already some history given in adult Sunday school today about what's going on. The Midianites uh, have overtaken Israel during this time. We understand that they were uh, sinning against the Lord, and much like it was before in the past chapters of Judges, uh, the people did evil and God sent something to smash them, and then he sent someone after they cried out to deliver them. And so we know during this context it's explained, but I want to look at something very important. I want everyone to, uh, um, and I'll give you a little bit of history again, just kind of refresh your memory of what's going on here. Uh, Gideon is called by the Lord to go and, uh, you know, rescue Israel in the Lord's name. And uh, we're going to look at verse 15 here. Um, and so I'll just go ahead and read and I'll give you guys the title of the message in a little bit, but let's start there in verse 15, chapter 6, verse 15 of Judges. And he said unto him, O my Lord, wherewith shall I have uh, saved Israel? Behold, my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. So already he's looking at his circumstances, as we heard before in adult Sunday school. He's saying, hey, my family's poor. There's no way we can afford to hire some people to help us out, to go fight this thing. Oh, Lord, I'm the least, which means he's the youngest out of all of his family. There's no way he can gather his brothers and his cousins and all of them. They're not going to listen to me. I'm the least. I'm the youngest. Now listen to what the Lord says unto him, Judge 6, 16. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midianites as one man. And so the Lord told him again, Hey, I'm going to be with you. And Gideon says, okay, and I'm just going to sum it up here real fast for 17 and 18 because I want to get to the point. Gideon says, okay, Lord, well, if I found, you know, pleasure in your sight or I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to offer you something, stay right here, don't move, and, uh, and we're going to see what happens. In verse 19, and Gideon went in and made ready a kid and unleavened cakes of an ephah flour, the flesh he put in a basket, and he put the broth in a pot. And he brought it out unto him under the oak and presented it. And the angel of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon the rock and pour out the broth. And he did so. Then the angel of the Lord put forth the end of the staff that was in his hand and touched the flesh and the unleavened cakes. And there rose up fire out of the rock and consumed the flesh and the unleavened, and the unleavened cakes. Then the angel of the Lord departed out of his sight and when Gideon perceived that he was an angel of the Lord, Gideon said, Alas, O Lord God, for because I have seen an angel of the Lord face to face. And the Lord said unto him, Peace be unto thee, fear not, thou shalt not die. 
So the title of this message is called The Flesh and the Unleavened Bread. And we're going to look again at exactly what the man of God, Gideon, did. So Gideon, he goes in verse 19, and he makes ready a kid. That's a, a goat, a baby goat. He makes it ready. Then he takes some bread. Then he takes some, pot, uh, some broth and a pot. And these things represent uh, Christians and your life with God. There's the flesh. There's the bread that you have, which are all the things that belong to you, your kids, your family, the things that are going on in your life, your job, all of those things that belong to you. These are the bread, the flesh and the bread, and they make up a good meal. They make up what the Lord wants. He wants this great offering. But let's look at what the Lord tells him. And the angel of, of God said unto him, Take the flesh and the unleavened cakes and lay them upon this rock. First Gideon came and he takes the flesh. He takes this and he's decided in his head how he's going to offer it to the Lord. I'm going to get this broth. And the broth, by the way, is all the seasoning, all the stuff of this world. Because remember, salt back then was only used to preserve me. And the broth was to give it some flavor. There's a lot of Christians right now that want some flavor in their life. And they get it from the world. And they're just going to deep the, dip the flesh, dip their flesh that belongs to God. If I just dip it in, in this broth and I do this, then I can give it to God. And then it's going to be right. And God says, what I want you to do is I want you to take that flesh and that bread and don't put it in front of me. That's not what I want. Don't go here, Christian. People, a lot of things say, well, I gave my flesh to the Lord and I'm giving my works to the Lord. And I know the Lord wants me to go and do this. And the Lord says, hold on, before anything, I want you to take this thing, put it on this rock. That's the altar. That represents an altar. God says, take your flesh, take your bread, take you, take your works, take everything. Put it upon the rock. You don't need that sauce. I want you to dump out that pot of broth. Dump it out. I don't want any of that. I just want the flesh. I want the bread. I want you to put it on the altar. And the Lord, he didn't consume it. He didn't eat it. He touched it. He touched both things. And fire consumed it. And that's what happened before the man of God even, dis even had the things like, whoa, this is the angel of the Lord. He took his flesh, he took his works, he put it upon the altar, and the Lord touched them. And boom, fire came out. Has the fire of God touched your flesh and your works? But you need to think about it. A lot of Christians today say, well, you know, I got this broth and I got this, and I believe the Lord. He just wants me to go out and he wants me to be a, an evangelist here, and I'm going to do all these and this and that and this. They haven't even brought it to the rock, much less brought it to the Lord, and they got an idea in their head what God wants to do with the flesh and the bread. So we understand about the rest of this story. We understand Gideon goes on and he does some great things. But before he did it, you got to understand, before he did anything, he went with the 300 men and all of that stuff. God touched his flesh and God touched that bread and God consumed it and fire it. And again, even when it got to the 300, God was trimming off bad bread, trimming off bad meat with the 300 because Gideon started out with a huge army with a bunch of things and God trimmed it up. No, I don't want that. I want that. I want, I want real flesh. I want real bread and I want it to me. A lot of people go out there now. We went to DC. We smashed it and we smashed it with what? Uh, with, with three men and our families, women, children, and we smashed it. We didn't need 20 men. We didn't need 30 men. We didn't need 30 men whose flesh is all messed up, who's giving all uh, crummy works to God, want to go out there and preach. Kids not in line. Wife's not even saved. They're going to D.C. They're going to Tennessee. They're going here. They're going there. We didn't get any of that. We went with three men and our women, our children, who were with us. Well, not my wife. My wife was behind. She was in the kitchen, but that's another thing. But we went there and we smashed it. And while we were there, we saw a whole group of uh, these anti-abortion people. They're not saved. They're not Christians. They had the wrong kind of flesh. They had, and their, their uh, bread, their works, going for the anti-abortion stuff, wasn't in the name of the Lord. Because a lot of them still believe, like, oh, no, don't put the, don't execute them. You know, oh, just, you know, they can be saved and this and that and this. And that's not what the Bible says. But they went there with the whole group. And those guys ran away like cowards. They scattered. 
As soon as they stood in front, boom. But you have three men, and you have a few women, and you have a few kids, and we go out there, our flesh is on the altar, our bread, our children, our wives are on that altar. God struck it with fire, and before you know it, they go scatter, and they don't want anything to do with us. A thousand of them against a small group, the right flesh, the right bread, put together a great meal. It was great unto the Lord. He touched it with fire, and boom, you saw what happened. That's right, <laughs> right. Couldn't even take it. As soon as they got, it was just a little, one homo there with his little flag, and then they go, oh, it's crazy. Amen. So, again, again, that's the context. We're talking about the flesh, and we're talking about the bread. And like I said, the flesh represents you, yourself, you, you personally. And the bread represents those things that God has given you, your job, your family, your house, your riches, all of those things that God has given you. That's the bread. So we're going to look at another example in this. I just wanted to kind of set up the context of that. Uh, I thank the pastor. He didn't coordinate with me on helping me out with that. But uh, that's what we're going to look at, the flesh and the unleavened bread. Uh, let's turn to 1 Kings chapter 17. Now, um, well, I'll give you some context on this one. Uh, so what's going on here? Uh, before I start, I want to kind of uh, set it up a little bit. Uh, we're going to look at some, uh, uh, some obstacles that this person had to go through. And I could have given many examples, and I had a lot of examples written out. Uh, but not only for the sake of time, because we don't go by that this Sabbath day, but we're going to look at... Uh, a woman being in this situation this time. And again, this goes for the men too. This is not a, a gender sort of thing or all of that, but it's important to understand that God used a lot of people and a lot of circumstances happened to uh, all sorts of flesh and all sorts of bread that was going on in the Bible. But this time we're going to look at a woman and there's two reasons. Uh, one, to shame the men. Because there's a lot of men who go through things like that and immediately fold, immediately get out of there. And two, because there have been uh, women who have come and gone, and we've seen them in this church, and if circumstances happen, or they realize, and, and this is a person, uh, and this represents a time when people say, I really want to serve the Lord, I'm going to give everything to the Lord, but the Lord's going to take a little of my flesh, and he's going to take a little bit of this bread that I have, and that should be good enough, that should be good enough, and it's not good enough, and we're going to see why. Uh, chapter 17 of 1 Kings verse 1 setting it up. And Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the inhabitants of Gilead, said unto Ahab, As the Lord God of Israel liveth, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. And if you know anything about rain, we understand rain comes down, rain does good, it, it waters your crops, it gives you food, it gives you water, it gives things like that. Uh, but also the Bible talked about no dew. No dew being upon the earth. That means not even when you go outside, everything's dry. If you've ever tried to pull up dry grass, it's a little tougher. It's a little tougher, but when that dew gets on it, it's wet, it's nice. You can dig in that ground, you can plow better and all of that. There was none of that. So plowing was tough, crops were tough, there was nothing going on. And we understand, to give you more context of the story, Elisha says this thing, there is a famine, there is a drought inside all of uh, inside uh, the land, what's going on. He goes by the brook after God tells him to go by the brook, and God feeds him with bread and flesh. God feeds him with bread and flesh, but we're not going to look at that this time. We're going to look at this uh, woman he talks about. And we'll, uh, go ahead, and you're going to go to verse 9. And this is the Lord talking. Arise, get thee to Zarephath, which belongeth to Zidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow woman there to sustain thee. Everyone say commanded. Commanded. That means God gave an authoritative order to a widow woman. She was told about this man of God. She was told. She was unctioned by God. And there's many times people say, I'm unctioned by God to do this thing. Okay? Now let's see if you walk it out. And we're going to go down to uh, 
or I'll read verse 10 to 14. I'll talk about it a little more. So he arose, this is Elijah, and went to Zarephath. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, the widow woman was there gathering of sticks. And he called to her and said, Fetch me, I pray thee, a little water in a vessel that I may drink. So God, he's going to ask a little bit of something you have. Mm -hmm. So a little sacrifice. Hey, a little water. Remember, there's a drought in the land. But God didn't say all your water. He said, give me a little water. And there might be a time you say, sure, oh, I can do that. I can give you an hour on outreach. That, okay, I can do that. I can do that. Let me go get this little water. And then watch what the... Watch what the man of God does again. Verse 11, and as she was going to fetch it, he called to her and said, bring me, I pray thee, a morsel of bread in thine hand. Now he's asking for more. Now God's like, okay, not, uh, not just an hour of your time, but I also want a little bit of your money, your resources. You got to put some gas in that car. You got to drive out there. No, 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 you're not. We're not carpooling. We're going to do a little driving. No, no. How about I don't come pick you up for outreach? How about you meet me out there? How about, how about we come over to your place and you serve the church and things like that? And you got inflation going on right now. You have all of these things going on. And people are like, oh, you know, I dedicated a little bit of this. I gave a little bit of that. But that, I mean, hey, I, I want to go with you. But if I get arrested, you know, there goes my money, there goes my day, there goes these things and that. I, I can't do that. So the Lord's upping it a little bit more. Let's continue to read. And she said, this is the widow woman, verse 12. And she said, as the Lord thy God liveth, I have not a cake, but a handful of meal and a barrel and a little oil and a cruise. And behold, I am gathering two sticks that I may go in. And dress it for me and my son that we may eat it and die. Now remember, this is a woman who God spoke to her, commanded her, and said, A man of God is coming. You're going to serve him. You're going to do all that. But when the rubber meets the road, immediately she's like, oh, I'm counting the costs. And again, this is not just the woman. I want you to look at it about yourself as well as a man. And you say, What am I willing to let go of? What am I willing to give of my own breath? What am I willing to do with my own children? My own children can do this. My job, my resource, I make money for my children to do this. I, I guess I can give to this and do that. Right? Just a little water, a little bread, and, uh, and now she's getting a little more kickback and she's showing you her place. Verse 13. And Elijah said unto her, Fear not. Go and do as thou hast said, but make me thereof a little cake first and bring it unto me. And after, make for thee and for thy son. And before she can protest, this is what the man of God says. Verse 14. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, the barrel of mill shall not waste, neither shall the cruise of oil fail unto the, until the day that the Lord sendeth rain upon the earth. And she went and did according to the saying of Elijah. She and he and her house did eat many days. So now the Lord has said, okay, I'll give you some more. You say that you're having trouble with this, you're having trouble with that. Well, okay, I'll bless you. I'll bless you with this. And immediately then she went to go do the things of God. You, have you ever been in a position where it's, oh, it's tough for me to do this, and God blesses you with this and that and this, and all of a sudden you're, everything is yours. God, I'm so blessed. I got the money. I got this. I got that. I got the time. I got the wife. I got all of these things. Oh, now I can do your will. Now I can do it. Oh, praise God. Oh, I, I'm the best Christian in the world because God has blessed me. Oh, oh, you got to give. It's easy to talk from a point of view of up here and say how good God is. Oh, that's easy. Oh, that is easy to do. It's easy. It's easy to give flesh to the Lord and bread when you have tons of it to give. But what happens when you don't have it? What's important to you when the things start to grow? And we're going to experience this over and over again as Christians. All of you, even you who've came now, you're new here, you're going to experience it too. There's valleys, but there's also mountaintops. And when those mountaintops happen, oh, it's so easy. It's so easy. Uh, you read in the Bible, there's many times of people who, and except Moses, who left the comforts of Egypt, there's not many times in the Bible where people were up here and the Lord spoke to them and they said, oh, my life is missing something. Oh, it wasn't until they got hit, until they got hurt. And this is what's going to happen, because this is someone that represents someone who has no trouble 
giving of the extra, giving of everything else giving of their own flesh even, but they have trouble giving that bread. They have trouble giving the other things that are of the Lord. I'll give my flesh, I'll give my body, I'll give all of that, but uh, I can't give you this. And, this are, and these are them. And we're going to see what happens right here. Verse 17. And it came to pass after these things. It came to pass after she got wealth, she's getting all these things, that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. Uh, the mistress of the house fell sick. They're talking about the son. And his sickness was so sore that there was no breath left in him. And she said unto Elijah, What have I to do with thee, O thou man of God? Or thou come unto me to call my sin to remembrance and to slay my son? But wait a minute. God, God commanded her. God commanded her. And immediately, when it's not going so well, and that's going to happen too, immediately when things are not going so well for you and God begins to mess with the other things in your life. He might not be going after your flesh, but he's going after that bread. And you say, well, oh, hold on, Lord, hold on. Are you closing this door on me? Maybe this isn't, I'm not in the right area. Maybe I need to get out of here. Maybe I need to go back to my old life. Maybe I need to go here and go there. Oh, hey, I'm in the church. I'm in the church. This is what you wanted. I'm here. So now, I, you know, the flesh and all that, it's good. I got of it. But what happens when God is like unctioning you to do more, to give that bread, not just your flesh, not just those things? What about your children? What about your career? What about all those other dreams, the visions, the things you have, 20 people getting saved underneath you and all of this? What happens when God says, I don't want any of that from you. I want that and these things that you have before we can even get to that. What do you say then? Well, what do you say then? And let's see what the man of God does. Let's see what the man of God does. And this is very important. This is where a lot of people fall back on. Verse 19. And he said unto her, this is Elijah, give me thy son. Give me thy son. Who else in here can give a true man of God your children? Who can give a real man of God the things you have, your time? All those things, not you, not your flesh, not you. It's great you die, but what about the other things? What about the bread? What about that? Can you give it to the man of God to do what's right? You say he's a man of God. God spoke to you audibly, said you're, it's you. This is the person I'm sending you. Can you do it? Verse 19, and he said unto her, give me thy son. And he took him out of her bosom. And carried him up into a loft where he abode and laid him upon his own bed. He had an altar. He had it right there. Laid that flesh, laid that bread of the woman upon that altar. His own bed. His own bed. Where the man of God has been reciting. Where the prayers are there. Where everything is going on. Own bed. That's where he put him. So the woman was given enough flesh, she was given enough bread, she thought that was good enough, and God said, I want more! I want more! So he took it. And God does what he wants. Who can stay God's hand? No one. Amen. So the best thing you can do is line up to get out of the way, to let God have that altar, and you put the flesh, not just your flesh, that's the easy stuff. Me, as a dad, that's easy to put my own flesh. I'll do it all day for my own children. For my wives. And you do it with your children. With your wives. <clears throat> verse, 20, uh, verse 22. And we're going to understand Elijah stretched himself out. He's on this. He does a few practical things. He gives the boy warmth. He gives the boy warmth. He tries to, you know, do a little resuscitation a little bit. But the main thing is his prayer and the man of God. That means the man of God in your life, if he's truly a man of God, he's going to do a few practical things. Go get a job. Go do this. Go do that. But none of those things are going to help you but the word that that man of God says to you. And then all of a sudden, if he's a true man of God and you follow that and you believe because that woman's out there in the living room. She doesn't know what's going on in that bedroom. She's out in the living room. She's praying. She's pacing. She's going back and forth. And all of a sudden, the Bible says in verse 22, the Lord heard the voice of Elijah. Heard it. Amen. 
And so the child came into him again, and he revived. By the word, he was revived. Verse 23, And Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the chamber into the house and delivered him unto his mother. And Elijah said, See, thy son liveth. And the woman said to Elijah, Now by this I know that thou art a man of God, and that the word of the Lord in thy mouth is true. Now remember, God commanded this woman at the very beginning. There might be times you're like, well, God spoke to me, said I'm supposed to be here. God said this, and as soon as God wants a little bit more of that flesh, as soon as God wants a little bit of that bread and all of those things that you're not willing to, part, uh, to give away with, it's easy to give extra, but God wants the source. God wants the root of those things. That's what God wants. And if you don't lay those things down on the altar, God's going to create a situation where you have no choice but to allow God to have that altar. And then you're going to have to figure out how to put them on that altar. Then, if you're not willing to put that flesh and that bread on the altar now, don't think it's going to all of a sudden come to you when things happen. It's not. So, but that's not what she really wanted. All of a sudden, she said before, if you remember, uh, just like the man of God, just like Gideon said, he said, oh, I've seen God face to face and I'm going to, I'm going to die. This woman, she didn't even talk about dying. She's like, yeah, it's a little bad. You know, hey, praise the Lord. Oh, I'm willing to die for Jesus. Talk is cheap. Amen. And God showed it was cheap because he said, okay, I'm going to take your son. And immediately she's, oh no. But before that, she was all for it. Oh yeah, my son's right. My things are right. My job is yours, Lord. This and that is yours, Lord. All of these things are yours, Lord. And as soon as God goes to take it, oh, God, maybe it wasn't God that called me. Maybe it was, well, he called you, Pastor, but he didn't say that how it was towards me, you know. And then that's what it's going to be. Oh, don't think that, uh, that it's just, that we're just missing it. Here's the thing, when we preach the word of God, when the pastor stands up here behind this pulpit, he's preaching the word of God to glorify God. And number two, then it's about himself because he searches his heart in this. And then number three, that sword is coming to everybody else. But don't think it's backwards. We got all these pastors in America, pastors in America that want to swing that sword to everyone else. And not one time does it glorify God. And not one time does it even touch them. But everybody wants a pastor now. Well, this guy, he, he says that, and that's who I want, and that's what I want. But is that man of God in your life, and I'm talking to everybody out there, people on YouTube, whoever watches, does that man of God say, give me thy son, give me those things, give me those that, so I can go ahead and show you how to, what to do to put it on the altar? And she didn't know until his word hit and it became true. So Elijah put the child on his altar, put him on his bed, and God blessed it. God touched that skin. God heard the voice, and boom, everything set up after that. And we know in, verse, uh, in chapter 18, we know uh, many days came to pass. That means many days this woman had food, had water, had all those things after those, and she was satisfied. It's not about the bread. It's not about the water. It was deeper than that. Then there are those who have the flesh to give. They have the unleavened bread. That means they want to lay down their life for God. And they want to lay down their uh, other things for the Lord. They want to give it to the altar. But the problem is they never find their way to the altar. They got all the ingredients. They got the perfect fish. Uh, that's themselves. They got, they got the bread. They got all these things. And they go. And instead of placing it on the altar, the table, they put it on the chair. They walk off. This is about them. Or they, they take these things. They say, uh... Uh, where do I put the bread here and I'll put the fish underneath the, underneath the rock. There's where it is. There's those that have all the ingredients, all the things that make up the perfect sacrifice and the perfect offering to the Lord. But they're, they're too busy, stuck in their own heads, want to do it them own, their own selves, can't make their way to the altar. They start on that path to put it down on the altar. Something comes up, and but hey, I still have these things. And oh, it's about me and it's that. And it's not. Let's go to John chapter, uh, oh, the last book of John, actually, 21. And this is a person where it's about their walk. It's about their praise. It's about their disciples. Yet they lack the altar, the altar, the rock. They have all the ingredients. Like I said, they have the altar. They have the ingredients, but they have yet to put it on those things completely.
And this is interesting because this is where I want to start it out right here. Uh, we'll, we'll read one verse and then I kind of want to show you where we're starting at. John chapter 21. <clears throat> Verse 3, Simon Peter saith unto them, and sorry to give you a little context, he's talking to some other disciples that are with him, and this has been some time the Lord uh, has risen again, the Lord has already visited them twice, twice, so these are those who hear the word, who know the word, they have their flesh, they have all the things that God talked about, what do I do? They go in circles. They have all these things. What do I do? And he says, I know. We'll go back on the things that we normally do. And, and let's just add a little bit of that broth that we had to pour out before. Verse 3. Simon Peter saith unto them, I go a fishing. There's my broth. Hey, let's just, hey, that's great. The Lord's here. I got, let's splash a little bit of that seasoning on this meat, on, on the bread. Guys, hey, let's go fishing. And they say unto him, we also go with thee. They're looking up to Peter. All right. Peter's like, hey, I'm going fishing. <laughs> okay. I mean, we just seen the Lord arise twice now. All right. Let's go. Let's go. Maybe we can talk about Bible on the boat. We can do that. We can go to Christian rock concerts and this and that. We can have Bible study after Bible study after Bible study and all these things. And as long as we have our own seasoning and doing our own things, hey, there's no need for the rock. We got it right here. They went forth and entered into a ship immediately, and that night they caught nothing. Everyone say nothing. Nothing. Because that's exactly what you're going to get the more you try to, uh, to avoid that altar. Right? You got all the ingredients, you got that, and you're like, I can't put this together. I'm just, I I'm going in circles. I don't get it. My wife's not listening to me. My kids, they're not... You know, they're, they're cool, they're okay, they're obeying, they're this, they're that. Oh, my job, it's, you know, it's great, it's this, it's that, but... And they're missing something. Now let's go down to verse, uh, let's go down to verse 12. And to give you to context of what's going on, there's a man who cries out from the side, it's Jesus, this is the third time he's appeared unto them. And he calls out and he says, hey, come, come on. And by the way, it was John who loves the Lord, who said John, the one he loved, is the one that nudged Peter and said, that's the Lord. He didn't even know it was the Lord. Amen. You keep missing those things long enough, you keep missing that altar, God's going to go ahead and close your ears to where you can't even notice the things that you noticed before. Because it was Peter before who knew it was the Lord. Amen. Well, oh me, Lord, stay away. I'm a sinful man. Don't come near me. After that miracle. Now he pulls all these fish onto a ship. And it was another man that had to tell him. A man of God. Who had to nudge him and say. That's the Lord. Because he didn't get it. Verse 10. Jesus saith unto them. Bring up the fish which you have now caught. Uh, they didn't catch fish. Jesus knew. <laughs> hey yeah yeah. Go ahead and bring those disciples here. And let me get. Yeah yeah. Bring that work over here. Let me see what you're doing. Tell me those scriptures again that you... God knows. Verse 11. Simon Peter went up and drew the net to land full of great fishes, 150 and three, and for all there were so many, yet was not the net broken. And Jesus saith unto them, verse 12, Come and dine, and none of the disciples durst ask him, Who art thou? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus, this verse 13, this is what I wanted to get to. Jesus then cometh and taketh bread and giveth them. And fish, likewise. Jesus had the fish. Jesus had the bread. And he can easily give it to whomever he wants to. You have the fish, you have the bread, and you can just as easily keep it to yourself and never put it on that altar. But guess what? You're not going to catch anything. Unless the seed dies, it cannot bear fruit. Unless a man takes that flesh and takes that bread and puts it on that rock, God is never going to touch it. And if God can't touch it, it's never going to be blessed. And if it's never blessed, then it's cursed. And if it's cursed, it's never going to produce anything. It's just going to create a generation and a generation of cursed. Amen. 
That's all you get. I'm close. I'm wrapping up soon. <clears throat> uh, verse 15. So when they had dined, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me more than these? And he saith unto him, Yea, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, Feed my lambs. Yes, Lord, you, you know I love you more than <laughs> you know I love you more than the world. You know, you know I love you more than those things. Jesus like, uh-huh. Where were you at? W weren't you just out there on the weren't you out there on the ship with all of them? See, talk is cheap. 16. And he said unto him again the second time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? He saith unto him, Yes, Lord, thou knowest that I love thee. He saith unto him, This Jesus, feed my sheep. Again, do, do you love me? And, and he's testing Peter here. He's waiting to see if he hears that old line of all those things. Oh, Lord, you know I love you. I'm not going to let anybody take me away from you. I got this. I got the flesh. I got this, Lord. I got these things and I got that. You know I'm never going to let. Peter was a man who was very strong-willed. Absolutely. He was strong-willed to the core. He's arguing with the Lord. He's arguing with God. And when he says, oh, God, you're not going to do that. You're not going to go and get whipped. You're not going to be persecuted, slandered. You're not going to be killed. No, 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 no. And the Lord's like, get behind me, Satan. And then the second time again, the Lord's like, hey, all of you are going to be offended. No, 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 not me. I'm strong. I got it. I've made disciples in my past. I've done this. I got the job. I got the family. I got all these good works. And God's like, no, you're not getting it. You're not getting it. Lovest thou me? That's what that meant. Oh, yeah, you can, you can. Uh, that's how God spoke. He was, God didn't need to say a whole line of things. That's the problem. There's a lot of preachers today that can quote paragraphs and do this and do that. And God just wants one simple word. He just wants to hear it from your mouth. That's it. Verse 18. Sorry, verse 17. He saith unto him the third time, Simon, son of Jonas, lovest thou me? Peter was grieved. See, God's going to keep poking and poking and poking until you're grieved. And this isn't just grieved, oh, he was grieved, he was heavy, he was sad. All those old emotions came flooding back to them. And if that's ever happened to you in here, if all those emotions come flooding back of how you used to be and all those things and that dread comes over you, it's because God's kind of trying to wake you up and it's the third time he's trying to do it. Lovest thou me? And he said unto him, Lord, thou knowest all things. Thou knowest that I love thee. Jesus said unto him, feed my sheep. Because he didn't get it the second time, so he had to get it this time. That's the reason why it says lambs, then sheep, then sheep. Because he didn't get it the second time. And this time God knew that he got it. The Bible says, come unto me, all those who are heavy laden and burdened. When we go out to preach, we are trying to make every sinner heavy laden and burdened. So that way God can wake them up and wake them up, pull them out of their slumber. That's what we do. We want them heavy, laden. Yeah. Educational evangelism does not work. Yeah. It will never work. Absolutely not. You can educate all you want, but God says, Come unto me. That's the only time they're good. When they're heavy laden, when they're burdened with all the things of this world, everything piled on top of them. They got their flesh in the one hand. They got their bread in the other. They don't know where to put it. And God wants that burden upon them so they can take it and put it on that rock so he can touch it and fire can consume it. That's the only time it's going to happen. Verse 18, and here it is. Verily, verily, I say unto to thee, when thou wast young, thou girdest thyself and walkest whether thou wouldest. But when thou, but when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thy hands, and another shall gird thee and carry thee whither thou wouldest not. This spake he, signifying by what death he should glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said unto him, "Follow me." And that's what God is telling every. Christian, every person, follow me. Oh, when you're young, you're doing all the things you want to do and all that, but you got to grow up quick. Grow up quick. 
And in closing, the only true way God is glorified is in the full laying down of all the flesh upon the rock, giving him a full meal by the laying down of the bread upon the same rock. That's all the things that you have, your children, your jobs, all those things. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Lord, oh Lord, we are nothing, Father, and you are everything.